In this video, we're going to take a look at graphical analysis. And in graphical analysis, it's oftentimes easiest to just set up three graphs, one on top of the other. And you're going to see clearly why over the next several minutes. And these graphs should be in a particular order. The very first graph should be a position time graph. And that's just going to plot our position with respect to time. So position is our dependent variable and time is our independent variable. You should also do velocity for your second graph, a velocity time graph. And then your third graph should be an acceleration time graph. Now, the ordering going from position to velocity to acceleration has more to do with calculus and that's not something that we're going to talk about in these videos because this is not a calculus based course but if you want to know the reasoning behind it wait until you study particle motion and calculus what we're going to do now is take a look at the specific properties for each of these types of graphs the position velocity and acceleration graph it's essential that you can perform these basic operations because that's what's going to allow you to reproduce all the other graphs um, if enough information has been given. And so let's take a look at some of those details right now. Actually, before I begin, I want to make mention of one more thing. In science in particular and with physics, two aspects of a graph become particularly important when it comes to analysis. The first is going to be the slope. Now the slope we designate with the letter M and the slope is just the change in Y over the change in X. Well on these graphs the Y axis is position which typically we use the letter X to denote position. It could be a letter Y if it's in the vertical dimension and the x-axis is our time axis. So for the position time graph we would write this as delta x over delta t. The other thing that we tend to look at with, with graphs is the area underneath the curve and the area under the curve is the area between the line which you draw and the x-axis. So the area under the curve could be above the x-axis and it could also be below the x-axis and the area under the curve would be this and this. Now on a position time graph the area under the curve doesn't mean anything and I'll mention that again in a couple of minutes but for right now I just wanted you to have that piece of information. So what are these properties that we're looking at on a position time graph? Well, for the position time graph, if we have a constant velocity, then that means the object's position is changing by the same distance during every time interval. So you might start out at the origin, and then one second later, you're here, and the next second later, you're here. And so constant velocity plots out as a straight line. Now, how would you calculate constant velocity or average velocity? By definition, that's going to be displacement divided by time, which is delta x over delta t. That's by definition. So what we can say is the slope of the line, the slope is equal to the velocity. We've already said that the area doesn't mean anything. All right, now if we're looking at accelerated motion, that is the velocity is changing with time, then we're going to end up with a curved line. So accelerated motion looks like this. It could also look like this if it's going in the other direction. Any type of curve on a position time graph is going to be accelerated motion. Now, when it comes to drawing accelerated motion on a position time graph, 
you don't have to be particularly specific. It's just most important that you know whether or not it's um, a slope which is increasing or a slope which is decreasing. Um, but that's about it. You don't, you know, you don't have to worry about the specific details that I get the shape of this curve exactly right because that's not what's important here. Finally, one of the last features we could look at with the position time graph is the y-intercept. And the y-intercept of a position time graph is going to tell you what the position of the object is um, or the initial position when time was equal to zero, when the motion actually started. So you might end up with a line that looks something like this. It starts here and it's just a straight line that looks like that. It could even be a curved line. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that this intercept right here, this is the initial position when time was equal to zero. So what's the big important information here that we get from a position time graph? Well, that is that the slope is equal to velocity. Area doesn't equal anything. That's not applicable. And the y-intercept is equal to the initial position. Let's take a look at a velocity time graph. And if an object is moving with a constant velocity, then we're going to get for every one second, the velocity is the same. For every time interval, the velocity doesn't change. So for constant velocity, we get a horizontal line. However, if the object is accelerating, then that means the line is not going to be horizontal because the velocity is changing. Remember that we defined acceleration as how fast the velocity changes, or mathematically, we said delta v over delta t. So if we start here at the origin, in other words, the object started at rest, that's going to be what our y-intercept represents, just like the y-intercept for the position graph was the initial position, the y-intercept for the velocity graph is the initial velocity. So if we start with an initial velocity of zero, and every one second later, we're going to increase our velocity by the same amount. So this would represent um, an acceleration. So our slope then is going to be delta y over delta x. The y-axis represents velocity. And if we just pick this point here as our final point, right here, so this would be v final. Down here, we would say v initial was equal to zero. And our time interval would go from zero to two seconds. So our slope is just going to be v final minus v initial. Remember, change in y. We start up here. This is the final. This is the initial. So it's v final minus v initial over t final minus t initial. But we started at time equals zero. And so v final minus v initial is just delta v. And t final minus zero, we just generally label it as t. Remember, anytime you see only the t by itself, that's typically going to represent a time interval where it's assumed t initial is zero. So anyways, the slope of this line um, is equal to the acceleration. That's the big idea. The slope equals acceleration. Now for the area, we're going to take a look at the constant velocity part of our graph, which we did in yellow. And that's because it's going to make what I'm about to do much easier to see. So what we know is this. Area is equal to length times width. The length of our graph is uh, v final. We go from 0 to v final, so we're just going to call that v. And the width of our graph goes from t 
initial is equal to zero to t final, so we'll just call that t to represent the time interval. And we know by definition that v times t, well, that's equal to d, a displacement. So the big idea here is that area is equal to displacement. Now, the y-intercept, once again, that's going to represent the initial velocity of the object. So what are the features that we have? Slope is equal to the acceleration. Area is equal to the displacement. And the y-intercept is equal to the initial velocity. Okay, finally, we get to acceleration. And the acceleration graph is actually a, a pretty straightforward graph to draw. Um, we will, on occasion, see graphs that look like this, where there's an actual slope to the graph, and then maybe it's horizontal. But this isn't something that we're really going to focus on. And the reason for that is you would end up with a curved velocity graph, and then you would have a doubly curved uh, position graph. And that just gets really, really weird. So if you do have an acceleration graph where there's a sloped line, you're never going to need to go beyond the velocity time graph um, whenever you construct these graphs. But I'm not even going to show you how to do them because they're really just that rare. So let's go ahead and get started analyzing, or at least the properties of the acceleration graph. So the acceleration graph, remember it's only showing acceleration. So if we take a look at um, our velocity graph, the constant velocity part of our graph, this is what we would get. There is zero acceleration, so we just stay on the x-axis. And I know you can't see this really well. Let me try to color that in for you. But this is what we have for our acceleration graph. Uh, the blue line, the one where we do have an acceleration, you have to remember that it's a constant acceleration in time. And we know it's constant because this is not a curved line right here on the velocity graph. So we would have to uh, have some actual values here to know what the acceleration is, but the acceleration is going to be um, just a horizontal line that is not on the x-axis. Now, if you have a line which has a positive slope, a positive slope is equal to a positive acceleration. A negative slope is equal to a negative acceleration, and I'm making reference to the slope of the velocity time graph. The same thing is going to basically be true about the velocity time graph coming from the position time graph, and that is when you look at the slope of the line of the position time graph, a positive slope is going to be equal to a positive velocity, and a negative slope is equal to a negative velocity. So what that means is that you're going to have a line which is horizontal if it's if it's a constant acceleration um, it's going to be a horizontal line but more importantly it's above the x-axis okay even if we look at this part of the motion right here okay even though we are at a, a negative position the slope is positive and that means our velocity is going to be a positive velocity and it's going to be a horizontal line because the velocity is not changing with time but it's going to be above the x-axis if you have a line which goes down and to the right that's whenever we go below the x-axis and we're going to see some examples of this here in just a few minutes all right now we've talked about the slope of the acceleration graph basically it's always going to be constant um, if you have a non-zero slope and I give you this information only uh, for your edification but it's nothing we're going to discuss or do anything with in class we don't even do it in AP Physics C but if you have a slope on the acceleration graph the slope is equal to a quantity called the jerk and 
The jerk is what happens when you're, say, stopped at a red light. And when you step on the gas, it kind of throws your head backwards. And then as you're just speeding up, your head just feels pressed backwards. Okay, so the jerk is the part that actually throws your head back. But when you feel like you're just being constantly pushed into your seat, that is acceleration. So the jerk is not something that we're going to discuss. The other uh, defining feature of a graph is area. And the area of the acceleration graph, in this case, if we look at this area, we have um, this shaded region right here. And we know that this is uh, going to be A, just, just A. And uh, our other dimension is T. So remember that area is equal to length times width, where the length was equal to A, the width was equal to T. And by definition, we know that AT is equal to delta V. All right, so we want to be really careful because delta V is not the same thing as V. D here, D is equal to delta X, which is not the same thing as X. So delta is final minus initial. So here we would have x final minus x initial. The implication is this. If you start from a velocity graph and they don't tell you what the initial position of the object was, it's impossible to completely draw the position time graph because you need to know what x initial is so that you know where to start your line. Same thing holds true if you're given an acceleration graph. This delta V, that's just V final minus V initial. But if they don't give you an initial velocity, if they don't say that you start from rest or you start with some initial velocity, then you have no way of constructing completely your velocity time graph. You can get the shape right. You can get some of the specific points on the graph right relative to each other but you can't draw the complete graph because you have to translate the line up or down somehow. You just don't know where it's going to be. In the next video, we're going to take a look at an example of constructing these graphs, and hopefully um, this all makes a lot more sense when you have it in context.